This is Road Noise, Life One Mile at a Time, episode number 11. Hello again, I'm Mike Blackston for Road Noise, Life One Mile at a Time. This is episode number 11, and it's the second time I've tried to record this episode. I recorded it a couple of weeks ago on the way back home from a commute, and when I tried to get it ready for editing, I couldn't find it anywhere on my computer, and all I can figure out is that I must not have saved it. I just don't know. Uh, I put the computer in the passenger seat with me. That's basically where you're sitting. If you're hearing some noise under the sound of my voice, that's just the noise of the road, and that's exactly why I titled this podcast, Road Noise, Life One Mile at a Time. This episode, we're going to be talking about young love. I'm going to tell you three different stories about relationship possibilities uh, or things that happened in my youth. And a couple of them when I was a child, one of them when somebody else was a child, and I wasn't a whole lot older. But um, let's get started. Now, for for the sake of the people I'm talking about. I'm not going to use their real names. I'm just going to use initials. And so we're going to talk about RJ, LL, who I'll just call L, and JW. And like I said, for the sake of their privacy, I won't say their real names. Now, I will tell you before we get started, if my voice sounds a little weaker than it usually does, it's because I'm going through some sort of a bronchial-type funk that uh, is not making me very happy because I'm a couple of weeks away from Curtin from, uh, with a show, a concert that my wife and I are directing, a Christmas concert, and here I go getting some sort of a bronchial thing, so I've got a very weak voice compared to what I normally have. At least it feels that way to me. It may not sound a whole lot different to you on that end, but I can definitely feel it. Right now, the commute, by the way, is between the house and Winfield and Carbon Hill, Alabama at this point. I'm going to go to Winfield for the first couple of days and then go to Carbon Hill on Wednesday. Then I'm going to truck about four hours north up to Cookville, Tennessee, and I've got a couple of places there that need some work done. And this is going to be one of the longest trips that I have ever taken away from the family all at one time. This is Monday morning, very early. The clock says 546 on the dash, Eastern Time AM, and I won't get home probably until the wee hours of the morning, Sunday morning. So it's going to be just about an entire week away, and that's not normal. I don't usually do that. I'm usually two or three days away, but this time it's right before Christmas as this is being recorded, and all of the stones that I've got to etch are ready at one time, and so I've got to try to squeeze everybody in who want to get the stones done before the Christmas break. And so this is going to be a very busy few weeks, but this is the biggest one before Christmas that I'm going to have, and so I'm I'm looking forward to it because I haven't worked a whole lot in the last couple of weeks, but at the same time, I know my hand is going to be so tired from etching by the time this trip is over. I'm really going to need a break, and I'm going to turn around the following Monday. I mean, I guess probably around 24 hours later, I'm going to turn around and go right back to, uh, where am I going? Where am I going next week? Next week, I'll be near Charleston, South Carolina, in a place called Walterboro. So that's where I'm going to be next week. Anyway, let's talk about what I wanted to talk about in this episode that I'm titling Young Love. Everybody's got those stories of when they were in grade school and teenagers, kind of things that stick out as unique or different. And these, I thought, were a little bit interesting. The first one, because I reconnected with this person after a long time never hearing from her and it was from sixth grade that's when the meat of the story takes place with RJ a little bit of background I think if I'm not mistaken it was fifth grade that I first met RJ but I was very shy as a child and I really didn't 
get to know her until sixth grade. She was, I think, the best friend of my then girlfriend, we'll call MR. And me and MR were on and again and off again. You know, it's fifth grade. You're, you're, you never know who you're going to be going with from day to day. And, uh, I took a shine to RJ, MR's really good friend. Fortunately for me, when we got to sixth grade, I found that I had been placed in the same homeroom class with RJ. And not only that, but she and I sat, she sat right behind me in homeroom class. So I got to know RJ over the course of the year. And during that time, we didn't just get to know each other, we became pretty close friends. We joked around all the time. Even though I was very shy, once I got to know you, I'm, I've always been a joker. I've always been a talker and a joker and just kind of had that entertainment mindset and that's just always been me. Well, through the course of sixth grade, I fell head over heels in love, I thought, with RJ. And we became, like I said, really, really close friends. And I finally got up the courage about two weeks before the end of the year. We, I mean, we, we joked around and became friends and, and were that way all through the entire year. And I just could not conjure up the guts to ask her to go with me until a couple of weeks before the end of the school year. But I still could not make myself just ask her. I couldn't even pass her the note in class, you know, the folded note that says, will you go with me, check yes or no. I couldn't even pass that in class to her. I just was too scared to do it. So I had this bright idea. I wrote a letter to her and sent it to her through the mail, professing my love to her. Now, when I recently reconnected, I don't think she remembers this. She thought it was really sweet, but she didn't really remember the letter. I did, though, because I remember how nervous I was waiting for her to get it. And on the morning that she got it, or the morning after it came in the mail, the next, very next morning, she comes up to my desk. I had gotten there early, and she comes in after me and stopped at my desk and said, if that letter that you sent in the mail was a joke, I'm going to kill you. I said, no, it wasn't a joke. And I'm not really sure whether she just told me, yeah, I'll go with you, or if she wrote me a note and said yes, or what. I don't remember how she reciprocated there. I just remember that we became boyfriend and girlfriend for two weeks before the end of the school year. And I remember being so happy uh, that this had happened until I got a note at the last day of school right before we got on the buses to go home. RJ handed me a note and said, don't open it until you get home. Well, I was a kid. I was a sixth grade kid. I wasn't going to wait till I got home, so I, I did wait until I got on the bus. And when I opened the note, it said something to the effect of, I want to be free this summer or something like that, and uh, I'm breaking up with you and we'll reconnect in seventh grade. Well, that broke my heart. Uh, but, again, it was sixth grade. I had my heart broken a whole lot, again, for a whole lot of reasons all through my life. It was no big deal looking back on it, but at the time, it was a pretty big deal for me, and I remember being bummed for a while about that and looking so forward to seventh grade as we moved into a different school for the middle school, and I was looking forward to meeting up with RJ again, but we never reconnected. I seem to remember her being there for seventh grade, but I'm not sure at some point, I think she moved away, but we never reconnected and that was, that was that. And again, at that point in my life, I was still so very shy, I wasn't the kind to go after what I wanted. So I lost touch with RJ until I was standing in line with my son just a few weeks ago, if you listen to our trip to Orlando, Florida for the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Studios. We did a lot of standing in line as you are wont to do in those situations and I was on Facebook 
looking around, and MR came across something she had posted, came across Facebook, because MR had, and I have been Facebook friends for a while. She is married now and uh, living a, what seems to be a blessed life, and I'm so happy for her. But something she put across Facebook reminded me of RJ, and I decided to have a look and see if RJ was anywhere on Facebook. And it didn't take long, and I, especially once I found out that she was a mutual friend of mine and MR, so there we go. I friend requested RJ, and she accepted. And at first I figured, okay, she'll recognize who I am, but she didn't recognize who I was at first. She needed to find some information about a mutual acquaintance that we had from the town we lived in, and she messaged me uh, several days ago asking if I had any contact with this person, and I didn't. I hadn't been in contact with that person in years and years, but then she comes back and says, your name sounds so familiar. Why is your name sounding so familiar to me? So I explained to her who I was, and I reminded her of the note that I had mailed, and then we kind of went back and forth because she thought that was just the sweetest thing, and it was. Looking back on it, it uh, it's kind of unique. It's uh, I, You know, I know that there are stories for everybody that are similar. The old folded note, will you go with me, check yes or no. It's a, it's an age-old thing that goes on with uh, kids of that age. But the fact that I couldn't ask her face-to-face, I couldn't even write a note and hand it to her or have somebody else pass it to her, I had to mail it. And if I'm not mistaken, you know, I'm a, I'm a dramatic person. I'm very involved with uh, theater and performance and stuff like that. Always have been, even in those days. I wanted to be a rock star, I believe, in those days. And so I've always had a flair for the dramatic. And if I'm not mistaken, in that note, it wasn't just, uh, will you go with me, check yes or no. It was, uh, I love you, I've always loved you, blah, 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 blah. You know, I, I, I kind of probably went overboard. If my memory is serving me correctly, I went overboard on that and got really melodramatic. So I, I, I would give anything to be able to get a gander at that note now. I'd probably be very embarrassed about it, but it'd be really neat to have a look at that old note. But that's my story of RJ. And uh, so she and I are Facebook friends now, and I uh, see her posts come across the page, and I'm not sure how much of my stuff gets across her page or not, but uh, it's really neat to reconnect with people from that era of my life now, being at this recording 42 years old. So moving on to the next story, several years pass by. I've moved, I'm still going to school in the school system where I lived in Georgia, but my mom had married a guy who worked quite a ways away in South Carolina, so we moved halfway between where I lived in Georgia previously and where he worked, and the place that we lived was just over the border in South Carolina, but my mom still taught in the school system, and because I was able to use my dad's address, because he and my mom were divorced, and they my dad still lived there at the uh, at the old place in Georgia. I was able to retain going to school there, and I just commuted back and forth. It was, it was about an hour drive one way, and so it wasn't too bad. And my mom taught school there in Georgia still, so we were able to do that. So I lived in South Carolina, and one afternoon, sometime I want to say in the fall because the fair was in town, the phone rang in the living room I remember I was sitting on the couch watching TV and the phone rang and I answered it and there was a young girl sounded to be about my age we'll call her L that's what she told me her name was well not L but for the purposes of this story that's what we're gonna call her LL were her initials and she had the wrong number and that was gonna be that but I was about to hang up the phone, and she stopped me and said, 
And she didn't tell me, I like your voice, I don't think, but she just started asking questions and started talking, and we began to have a conversation. And we talked for a while and then hung up, and that was that. And the next day, the phone rang again, and it was L. and we talked, and I believe it was in the second conversation where we decided, this phone thing's not going to work, we're going to have to meet. And that would actually turn into how I met my wife uh, later. I'll have an entire episode on how I met my wife. Uh, just to tease that, she, I was working at a radio station and she was a listener. So we met over the phone too. But uh, back to Elle, she and I decided that because the fair was in town, we would meet out at the front gate of the fair. And I was excited because at that time I was in high school... 14, 15 years old because I we moved over to South Carolina the year, the summer before I went into high school and we made this date, this blind date to meet and I remember telling my mom that I was gonna meet this girl and my mom put the kibosh on that right from the start. She said, I, I know that you're excited to meet this person but you have no idea who she is. You don't know whether she's really as old as she's saying she is. You don't know whether she's really as young as she's saying she is. She was telling me she was around my age. You don't know anything about this person, and I'm not going to let you just go, you know, at 14, 15 years old on your first date, a blind date, and meet somebody at the fair that you met over the phone. I'm, not, I'm just not going to do that. My mom probably had some sort of, you know, she's a mom. She had some sort of sense about these things and uh you know nowadays it's meeting on facebook and meeting on these uh social media sites and stuff like that that's the danger for kids but my mom kind of was ahead of the game and she was smart and she uh, said that you're not going to do this now it turns out that it was legit l was really my age and was just enjoyed the conversation we had and she and I wanted to meet and so she was as legit as they come and what really got me angry was a little bit later I saw where she had won I want to say homecoming queen I think it was homecoming queen it was something like that some sort of a beauty contest and the person on the front of the newspaper was absolutely gorgeous and had the exact same name and was the exact same age. And I was pretty sure that that was her. All evidence pointed to that is who that was. And I got really angry at my mom at that point because I'm thinking, you know, I could have been dating the homecoming queen of this place, you know. But, hey, it worked out great. I recently reconnected with her because, actually, I contacted her after I recorded this episode the first time because I wanted to let her know I found someone of that same name, again, on Facebook, in the area, and I said, look, I don't know, you don't know me, I said, but this happened several years ago, and I just spoke about it and told the story on an episode of my podcast and I wanted to let you know when I'm going to release it if that if you're the one that I was supposed to meet at the front of the fair and I was hoping to God that she was not stood up I'm I'm hoping she ended up not showing up too I don't know this person after going back and forth on instant messenger we we decided it's probably her because she did win homecoming queen and at the time, she said that, that was kind of the thing to do back at the, in the day at, at that age. Uh, she, was, she was around the same age as me, and she said that was the thing that the, the girls would do, is meet the guys at the fair. And so we're thinking it might have been her. And I reconnected and told her I was going to let her know when I'm releasing this. And so now uh, I have to re-record this entire thing. So that was Elle, and that's neat. I don't know anything about her life, what's going on with her, so I couldn't tell you any more, and I wouldn't because that's private for her, but 
what a neat story. I, I just really, I like reconnecting with people from my childhood. I think it's so neat to find out where they are now and what they're doing. But this last story, we're going to talk about JW. And this story kind of depends on who you are, where you come from, your worldview and things as to whether you think when I get to the end of the story it's good or bad that'll be kind of up to you I'm not going to try to sway you one way or the other I will tell you that it kind of broke my heart based on my memory of JW from the start you know knowing her from the beginning of the story and then learning from the end kind of broke my heart. So JW, JW came into my life after I started working at the same radio station I was telling you about where I met my wife. And I actually, I met JW before I met my wife and carried on our little, uh, you wouldn't call it a relationship, but all right, let me just get into the story. I was 19. JW was a caller. She was a listener of mine at the radio station. I worked from 7 to midnight, Monday through Friday, had my own live show, took requests and call-ins and stuff like that. It was a country format in the early 90s. And JW was, like I said, she was a listener, she was a caller, and she called every day. She called within 10 minutes of me getting on the air. She would always call by probably 7.10, 7.15. The phone was ringing, and there she was. Day in, day out, every single shift. As soon as I got there, JW was on the phone. The thing about JW was, I said I was 19. She was 11. She was smitten with me at the time. And I don't know why. I think probably because she probably called one time and I played her request and was nice to her. I've, I always tried to be nice to my listeners no matter who they were. And because I was nice and polite and a gentleman to the young lady, she kind of took a shine to me. She had never met me. She just knew me by my voice. But she started to call every every evening right after my shift started and so it kind of became a thing I knew JW was gonna call and I was it was just part of my shift she would call and I would talk to her for four or five minutes and we would hang up the phone and that was that and sometimes she would call you know a couple of times again during my shift but because she was 11 and I was there till midnight you know it was usually earlier on before she would you know she would she would usually just call me earlier on in the shift now, that was fine, because that was normal. I had a lot of young preteen girls who called that liked to talk to the DJ. That's just part of the job. They call all the time. You're nice to them. You play their requests. You get to know them by name, and that's that. Where it starts to get dicey is when you find yourself meeting them in person. And that happened to me one Sunday afternoon I want to say it was in the spring near Easter. In fact, it may have been an Easter Sunday because what happened was I was working a Sunday morning shift. I think I did usually work Sunday mornings. But I remember this was a particular Sunday morning and JW shows up at the front door of the radio station with her mother. Now, I didn't know that was JW at first. I just saw a lady a little bit older than me not a whole lot older than me but a little bit older than me with a young girl and this little girl was beautiful I mean she was uh, just dressed up in her Sunday best her little sundress and her like I said I think it was Easter or around Easter and she was dressed to the nines her mom had even put her in makeup and everything she'd really dressed her up to come meet Mike Blackston. They didn't warn me they were coming. I had no idea they were coming, but 
they showed up at the door, and so I let them in, and they introduced themselves, and it was J.W. and her mother. And they were there for probably four or five minutes. I think I took them into the control room to give them kind of a tour of the radio station, show them what I did. If it was Sunday morning... On Sunday mornings, we usually played church programs, so there wasn't a whole lot I was doing. I wasn't live on the air at that time. So I was able to give them a little bit of a tour of the station, and then that was that. And before we left, JW asked if I had some sort of uh, something I could give her, like a signed photograph or something. Well, I had been involved in some sort of what was supposed to be a Broadway review type touring company that I was planning to be a part of and we had had some glossy headshots made and I had some in my car so I ran out to my car I got one and signed it for her the celebrity type thing it's first time and only time I believe that I've ever done that I may have done that one other time for a listener but I handed it to JW, and that was that. They headed out. And a couple of days later, her mom calls me and tells me how much that meant to her, to the little girl. She said that she just was on cloud nine, having gotten to meet me. And then her mom told me the weird thing, and it, it wasn't weird for her, but being, a, at the time, an adult with a, an 11-year-old girl fan it kind of felt a little weird she told me that her daughter had put that if I'm not mistaken put that photograph on her ceiling above the bed so she could look at it when she went to bed so that was kind of weird for me you know I know celebrities get that type of stuff all the time but as far as I was concerned I was just a radio jock I know that that kind of celebrity mentality can happen between jocks and listeners but for me, I sure didn't feel that way, and it, it felt kind of, of weird, especially with it being uh, such a young girl. The next thing that happened was even a little bit weirder and kind of made my wife raise an eyebrow a little bit. Not that she was concerned or felt in any sort of a competition, but my wife and I met because my wife had been calling again she was a listener and I finally asked her out and we started going to see the movie Aladdin we saw it several times in the theater there was a dollar movie theater right down the little strip mall from where the radio station was and they were playing Aladdin so we went to see it several times just paying a dollar for the ticket price and at some point for some reason I mentioned in one of our conversations that Kayla and I were going, and I guess, I don't know, she may have asked when and what show or whatever. I, she got the information somehow, and I guess I just didn't think anything of it. We get to the movie theater and start sitting down, and there's a line of girls in front of us, all about 11 years old in that range. All of a sudden, one of them turns around, and there's J.W., she had managed to get her mother to bring her and a whole bunch of her friends to that movie at that showing so that she could get a glimpse and show them her DJ friend. So, I mean, it, it didn't go any further than that. She was just there, and then we watched the movie, and we all left, but that was kind of okay. After that, I sort of lost touch with JW. There was an incident where she called the radio station one night, and one of the other jocks that I was relieving was there, and he was just kind of sitting across the way from me, and we were talking after I had started my shift. And JW had a friend over that night, and the friend wanted to talk to the DJ, and once she started talking to me, she realized there was another jock there, and it was one she liked, so she started asking could she talk to him, so I'll put him on the phone with her. She started talking inappropriately. I will never forget the look on his face. She, she wasn't on speakerphone or anything like that. It was just on regular phone. 
And he's sitting across the way from me doing his thing, being nice to her and, and, you know, giving her the little thrill of talking to the DJ. And again, these girls are by this time probably 12 years old at the most. And all of a sudden, the jock sitting across from me turned red as a beet. And his eyes got as big as saucers. And he started shaking his head kind of in the no fashion to me like, I can't believe what I'm hearing. And so he had to stop the young lady and say, stop what you're saying right there. And at that point, he started correcting her. He said, you can't talk to people that way. You can't speak, first of all, to an adult, but especially someone you don't know in that manner. She had started making sexual comments to him that were blowing his mind. And he got her, you know, he really got on her case about it as he should have, trying to correct her for doing this. Well, J.W. got back on the phone with me and kept apologizing. I'm so sorry. I didn't know she was going to do that. I am so sorry. After that, I kind of lost touch with her. I think she got embarrassed and she started or she stopped calling. And so I really lost touch with her at that point. Move up several years. And I am working overnights on the weekends at a major radio station in Greenville, South Carolina, a 100,000 watt radio station, WESC 92.5. And I got a call one night, and the voice sounded very familiar. And she said, Is this Mike Blackston? And I said, Yeah, it's Mike. She said, You don't remember me. My name is JW. I remember you from 103.1. I used to call you all the time. And, well, this girl by then was an adult. That's why I recognized her voice. She, it was an adult woman's voice, but I had talked to her so much, the timbre of her voice, I remembered it. And that was really great to reconnect with JW. And I said, what are you doing now, JW? And she said, I'm working. I'm a dancer. And I thought, that's great. That's wonderful. I love theater. I love the performing arts. What kind of dancing do you do? Pole. <laughs> and my heart sank. She said she was a stripper. Now, here's where I'm not going to try to, you know, push any sort of agenda or anything on you. As a, as a Christian, I don't have to tell you my thoughts on why it broke my heart to hear that J.W. had turned into a stripper. But it broke my heart that J.W. had turned into a stripper. And on top of that, she apologized if she sounded a little bit weird on the phone because she said she'd been smoking a little pot and she was a little bit high. So that broke my heart even further. And then she further broke my heart by starting to try to speak she didn't, she didn't really try to come on to me, really, except to invite me for a free lap dance at the place where she was stripping. And I just, you know, first of all, I was married by then. And second of all, even if I hadn't been, all I could see in my mind's eye was this a little 11 or 12-year-old girl in her spring Easter outfit standing there with her mother I couldn't get that image out of my mind so I couldn't marry the two images anyway even if I had been the type that would go and, and take her up on that offer and I don't know where she is now I, I did look her up on Facebook to see where she was now because you never know what, some, what somebody's doing that was years and years ago a decade ago over a decade ago that she called me and reconnected uh, as a grown-up. I have no idea what she's doing now, where she is, because I could not find her on Facebook. But I hope everything's okay with her, obviously. But that was weird. That's, uh, that's my story of young love. Two stories of my young love, and then uh, another story of me 
and uh, the young love of a young listener. So three stories I thought you might be interested in for this episode of Road Noise. If you'd like to get in touch with me, if you'd like to tell me your story of young love, I would love to hear it and relay it on the show. You can do it that a couple of different ways. You can either just let me retell it, and you would do that by contacting me at my contact page on the website at www.roadnoisepodcast.com. You can also just send it straight to the email at roadnoisepodcast at gmail.com. You can also give me a call on my hotline, and that's 706-389-0401. That's 706-389-0401. Now, if you give me a call there, go ahead and tell your story, and I'll actually put your voice on the air unless you just tell me you don't want to. You can leave a message on the hotline and say, I don't want my voice on the air, and that's fine too. However you call the hotline... If you do call the hotline, make sure that you reference Road Noise so that I'll know which podcast that line covers a couple of different podcasts that I host. So make sure you reference Road Noise. Other than that, you can also touch base with me via Facebook at facebook.com slash Podcast. I'm on Tumblr as Michael Blackston. I'm on Twitter at Everything Arts. I'm also on Instagram as Michael Blackston. But other than that, we're getting into Atlanta. This is the perfect timing to stop this podcast because traffic at 622 on I-85 South in Atlanta is murder. And so I am not going to be holding a microphone any longer. I look forward to hearing from you. I would love for you to go to iTunes and give me a rating and review if you feel like this is the type of show that you would like to uh, continue listening to please subscribe and i'll talk to you next time as you sit in the passenger seat with me as we ride along on these road trips for road noise learning life one mile at a time